Okay. Okay then, picture the scene. It's 1991 and the Japanese Grand Prix. Senna has just taken the chequered flag and with that become a three-time world champion. The only person with more world titles at this point in time is Fanjo, and Senna being Senna, he wants more. But there is good news and bad news. The good news is Alan Prost has called his Ferrari a piece of crap and has now been sacked, meaning he's going to have to sit out the 1992 season. But the bad news is Nigel Mansell's just got himself a new company car. Williams had been fiddling around with the next big thing in racing car design. They'd fitted driver-controlled ride height adjustments and traction control to their cars. And while they hadn't been the first to fit a flappy paddle gearbox to the car, they were probably the ones who got it honed to the point where it was going to be competitive. And as a result, Mansell would either be first or second in every race he finished in 1992, and the driver's title would be wrapped up by the Hungarian Grand Prix. That's the 11th round of a 16-round season. That 1992 Williams was something else. But Senna would still win three races that year, one of them being at Monaco where he held off Mansell's Williams in the closing stages on knackered rubber, and he would also win in Hungary and Italy. But due to retirements in Mexico, Brazil, Canada, France, Britain, Japan and Australia, he would finish fourth in the standings behind Mansell, Patrese and this new kid called Schumacher. So moving on into 1993, McLaren brought their new car to the World Championship the MP48. This time it was powered by a Ford V8 engine instead of the Honda V12 the cars had been using in 1992. These engines also weren't factory fresh, Benetton were getting the more powerful ones first, and the plan was for McLaren to get Renault engines instead but the French company had given a big fat non to that because they were already supplying Williams. But it was still somehow able to be competitive despite being 20 horsepower down on the customer Ford V8s and almost 100 horsepower down on the Renault V10. It also had a fully automatic gearbox that could be swapped over to flappy paddle mode if need be and also had traction control and active suspension, which suited Senna's aggressive driving style. And Prost initially struggled to get to grips with his Williams as he felt the car needed to be lobbed around a bit to get the most out of it, which wasn't his thing. But then Prost figured his car out and won the title with two races to spare. But in the middle of this, Senna was on a $1 million race by race contract. The car handled well, but it was sorely lacking power and Senna knew that the only way he was going to win another title was to get into that Williams. The McLaren was lighter than the Williams thanks to that V8, but the power to weight of the Williams was so much better. And up until the Canadian Grand Prix, Senna was leading the championship. So as you can imagine, this left Senna very, very frustrated, but that's how winners are. We've seen in the past the likes of Vettel, Verstappen, Hamilton and even Schumacher be a little bit upset when things don't go their way. Because for winners, anything less than a win is a total failure. There are two theories behind this 1 million per race deal. The first is that it left Senna ready to move to another team the second that a good car, preferably the Williams, became available, so he wasn't trapped in getting out of a contract. And the second is that it was all marketing on Ron Dennis's part to keep Marlborough and the other partners and also the media interested. But it's, it, it's, it's probably the first one of those things. Senna needed that Williams. Assuming it finished every race, you'd think Senna in that FW15C would have won almost all of the races in that thing. But then things started to pick up. Not so much in the results, but at least the car was starting to be a little bit more powerful. Ford was now allowing McLaren and Benetton to have the same V8 engines in the back of the cars. But Williams was now romping away with things. They won seven in a row. Prost took four wins and Damon took three. But at least Senna had a little bit more power. But in the background though, Ron Dennis was having some advanced talks with Chrysler. Chrysler owned Lamborghini at this time, and Lamborghini Badge V12s were often found in some of these back-of-grid teams, but did nothing but break down. So Lambo's parent company Chrysler approached McLaren and Ron Dennis and basically said, look, we need a team that actually knows what it's doing to give our engines the beef that it needs, and you can have a good engine again, and then we can sell this good engine to other teams, and it will all look good, especially if we can win Senna that fourth world title. So at the Munich Motor Show, Ron Dennis had a handshake agreement with Bob Lutz of Chrysler and they set about making something work. And it wasn't an easy task because Lamborghini needed to make the engine fit the MP48 and McLaren needed to make the MP48 accept this engine somehow. Now in terms of an actual picture of the car, well, I can't find any that I'm allowed to use, but let's be honest, it's just the MP48 painted white. 
I mean, it's probably about a foot longer, but it's pretty much the same car. But there is the MP48 available for R Factor 2. I might just B-roll that in. After the Portuguese Grand Prix, the McLambo was ready to roll and Senna was the first to have a go in it. When he got out of the car, he was beaming. He loved it. And he also convinced the designer of the engine, Mauro Forgieri, to alter the characteristics of the engine ever so slightly. Senna suggested sacrificing the power at the top of the rev range to have more in the middle. And normally, Forgieri wouldn't do such a thing, but since he respected Senna's opinion, he decided to take a punt on it. And while the engine lost 25 horsepower at the top, it gained 40 in the middle. And the engine became more powerful than the Ferrari V12 that was being run in the... Um, well, the Ferraris. It also became much more stable to drive and was better on tyres than before. I don't know if that's due to the longer wheelbase, but, you know, I'm not an engineer. But Senna got what he wanted. Power. That's all he cared about. He'd figure out the driving stuff later, but at least now he had power. Just give him power. And while testing this car at Silverstone, Hakkinen had the car blow up on him. The engine just properly full on exploded but Senna was telling Dennis that they needed to run this car at the Japanese and Australian Grand Prix it was quick enough if it grenaded itself it grenaded itself but he was prepared to take that risk but weirdly Dennis was also at this time in advance talks with Peugeot who were promising factory support and an updated Group C V10 to McLaren instead Dennis was also courting them on the potential of beating Peugeot's arch rivals Renault in Formula One now it's alleged that Dennis did not want this McLambo to do well on track because of this new signing with Peugeot and it's also alleged that the McLambo had run on full tanks at Estoril and Silverstone without Senna or Hakkinen's knowledge to try and slow the car down or have it appear that it hadn't done much for the handling. Now some sources say that Dennis was already in talks with Peugeot when the McLambo thing happened and some say that McLaren didn't believe that Lamborghini would keep up the development of the engine so went with Peugeot as a safer option and have more development cash available. But there is a book called Ayrton Senna All His Races by a guy called Tony Dodgins and in that he interviews Martin Whitmarsh who said the following. Lamborghini showed us the latest telemetry data and the engine was fantastic, with 60 horsepower more than the one we had and 66 fewer pounds. But I didn't believe the figures because I could see how slow LaRouze's cars were. I remember we went over to Lamborghini and hooked the engine up to a dyno and the needle actually reached the HP numbers they were talking about. In the end we didn't believe Chrysler was going to keep their promise of developing the engine and made a deal with Peugeot for 1994. We had the test with Lamborghini engine lined up, but due to contractual obligations, I told Dave Ryan, the team manager, what was supposed to happen during the test. The car couldn't go any faster than X. If that happened, we'd have serious contractual problems. And then I added, don't worry though, it won't happen. Dave called me from the track and said, look, I can't stop this car from speeding up. It's really fast. It's looking really good and it has Ayrton inside. So I told him to fill it with 220 pounds of fuel and not mention it to anyone. It was a huge mess and I had to manage it. But Ayrton obviously realised that it was faster than with the Cosworth engine and he wanted to compete with a Lamborghini engine in the year's final three races. He was really upset when we didn't do it. So it makes you wonder then why they even bothered doing this test with Lamborghini if Ron Dennis was already going to sign with Peugeot unless it was a trap by Ron Dennis to get Senna to sign on properly for 1994. I mean, who knows, but either way, it never really turned out the way Dennis had planned because Prost announced his retirement after the Portuguese Grand Prix and Senna was then sliding into Sir Frank's DMs like some creep on Instagram. And McLaren's partnership with Peugeot wasn't exactly brilliant. The engine brought in for 1994 was underpowered and unreliable, and the fears that there was going to be no support from Lamborghini rang true with Peugeot instead, as there was virtually no engine development for the whole of 1994. So for 1995, McLaren switched to their fourth engine manufacturer in as many seasons, as they began their other legendary engine partnership, this time with Mercedes. The wins took a while to materialise again, as Senna would win the Australian Grand Prix of 1993, but it wouldn't be until another Australian Grand Prix, this time in 1997, that David Coulthard would stand at the top of the podium for McLaren. 
So then a quick look at the McLambo that would have potentially brought McLaren back to the front in the mid 1990s if it had actually gone ahead. If it's been something that you've learned something new through here today or if it's just a little bit more detail on something you've only got a passing familiarity with then do give the video a thumb up and if you do want to see more from this channel obviously subscribe if you haven't already and get the bell on as well so you never miss out on a future video. I'm over 80,000 subscribers now so you know less than 20k to go until that Moreno video. You know what to do. Massive thanks as ever to the kind folk over at Patreon. And if you want to help support the image buying fund, then you can do so by following the link down in the description, where there'll also be links to Discord and also to my socials. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward. Have a cracking day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.